Welcome everybody to Shadows on the Tesh, um, the place where, you know, history just kind of intersects with preservation. And uh, we're happy to have you all here this morning. This, uh, this fall, we're hosting a series of programs on the history of education in Louisiana. Um, we had a great program a couple of weeks ago by Ruth Foote. And um, today's program is the second of this, of this series, supported by the Louisiana Endowment for the Arts for the Humanities and the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities. Mark your calendars for the final program of the series on November 7th. And we'll be hosting uh, speaker, Dr. Leona Tate, whom we know uh, was one of the four children who integrated um, public schools of New Orleans in 1960. It's gonna be a great program. We hope to, hope to see you there. This morning, we're very honored to welcome Dr. Sarah Hyde. Dr. Hyde received her doctorate from Louisiana State University and published Schooling in the Antebellum South in 2016. She recently completed a work of historical fiction titled Rebel Bayou and is a professor of history at River Parishes Community College. Now, after the program, there'll be a light reception and a book signing. So hope you stay around for that and, um, and join us and Dr. Hyde in the signing of her book. So join me, please, in giving Dr. Hyde a very warm shadows welcome. Thank you, Dr. Hyde. Thank you, Dr. Hyde. Thank you so much. Very much. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. I appreciate y'all coming out on a Saturday morning to be here with us to talk about history. Um, I appreciate the shadows for having me to talk about my research on antebellum education. I appreciate the LEH and the NEH for the funding to make this lecture series possible. And I appreciate y'all coming out. You know, um, my day-to-day -day job is teaching undergraduate students. Um, I teach at a community college in Gonzales and um, they don't always show up for class. <laughs> and I can guarantee you on a Saturday morning, <laughs> attendance would be pretty low. And so I appreciate y'all taking your Saturday morning, this beautiful morning in October to be with us to talk about history. So my, the title of my book, um, which was published by LSU Press, is Schooling in the Antebellum South, the Rise of Public and Private Education in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to kind of give you a synopsis of the research that I've done um, and the findings that I've made about antebellum education in the South, which is just not something we know a whole lot about. Um, when I first started doing this research as a graduate student in the early 2000s, um, most books said that there was no education system in the South. When I was in graduate school, this was the textbook on Southern history. Okay, um, co-authored by William J. Cooper Jr. and Thomas Terrell. Cooper was a professor at LSU at the time and would go on to be my major professor as a matter of fact. Um, so the fourth volume of this was in production when I started doing my research. And in it, it states during the anti excuse me during the antebellum era, no statewide public school system existed. And when I started doing my research, I found that that just was not the case. The history books all said that there was no education in the South. It was just not well documented, and it was not going to be easy to quantify. I believe that one of the reasons why Southern learning has been overlooked is that the history of education as a field focuses on the New England model, specifically Massachusetts and those first schools started in Boston. Free public schools for all. While Southern states would attempt to establish those sorts of schools in the antebellum area, rural settlement and low population density would make it difficult. Regardless, Southern states and their inhabitants showed a clear commitment to learning and education. Like for us, most Southern children started learning inside their own homes. Just as that is true today, most caregivers start going over the ABCs and colors and numbers with children under their care. That was the case in the antebellum era as well. Parents took on the responsibility for teaching young children reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
if there were older siblings and especially unmarried aunts and uncles in the home, this task was often delegated to them. A perfect example of this comes from a book of memoirs written by Celine Fremo Garcia and edited and published as a monograph. She tells about her life growing up in New Orleans, starting out in New Orleans, her mother was French, and then moving to Baton Rouge as her father's career progressed. She writes a lot about the sort of education she got from her mother. And in her reminiscences, although she is clearly prideful of her academic achievements, there's also a level of bitterness to the way her mother conducted those lessons. They had to start their lessons in French grammar before 7 a.m. each morning. And they were not allowed to leave their desk until they had conjugated their French verbs. If that did not happen before breakfast, they were served a piece of dry toast at the desk while they continued working. She is especially sad about her younger brother and the treatment he would get often off task. He found himself in trouble. Celine explains, quote, he had his ears pulled so often that he was hardly ever without little scabs at the back of them and his head would be bumped against the wall so that he often used to say, as soon as I am big enough, I will run away. Celine bemoaned her mother's constant teaching. She explained, quote, we never played out of her hearing. So if we played ladies and pretended to go traveling, we had to go someplace that really existed in that special part of the globe. If we mentioned the name of a city or a lake, she would call out, where is that city? What river runs near it? What is manufactured there? And we felt as if we had an extra lesson on hand. There is lots of evidence of mothers taking on this early responsibility of teaching young children inside the home. In Catherine Clinton's plantation mistress, Woman's World in the Old South, she explains that educating children was a primary duty of upper-class mothers, along with instilling morals and keeping them physically safe. In addition to mothers teaching children, there's anecdotal evidence of fathers also taking on this responsibility, as well as aunts, uncles, and especially older siblings. Families often encouraged aunts and uncles to join them in their home and take on the responsibility of giving lessons to younger children. Older siblings who had benefited from more formal education were often expected to impart their knowledge on younger siblings. Such was the case of Thomas Ellis in Clinton, Louisiana. He attended Centenary College and returned back home to live with his parents and his family before going to New Orleans to study law. While living at home in those years, he instructed his younger siblings as recorded in his diaries and letters. He must have earned a bit of a reputation as a tutor because he was invited by Pine Bluff Academy to work as a teacher for them in 1855 and they told him to quote, name his price. They were willing to pay whatever it would cost to have him. In addition to family members, many Southern families hired tutors. Tutors were often young men or women who had graduated from college and worked teaching for a few years before choosing a profession. Often these tutors were Northern educated, often coming from New England states. For the men, they often taught for a few years before choosing a profession, going into the ministry, or becoming a lawyer. For women, they often worked until they got married. For both female and male teachers, this time seemed to be temporary where they were spending time with young people. And they stopped working once they found a more lucrative career or a more settled family situation. There are obvious benefits to what we would call today homeschooling. If employing a family member, obviously there were uh, financial benefits to not having to pay. But because of the rural nature of Southern society, schools were often situated too far from a home to easily be able to travel to and fro. Bringing in a tutor or a private teacher eliminated the need to travel or to board away from home. Keeping children at home also allowed parents to supervise them constantly and eliminated anxiety, anxiety about extended separations from family. Keeping kids at home also meant that they were around to help with tasks as needed. The informality of homeschooling allowed harmonization with the rhythms of family and agricultural life. Lessons could easily be put on hold when young girls were needed to help with a new baby or boys were needed in the fields. Such accommodations perfectly suited the lifestyle of the agricultural South. The prevalence of this type of learning illustrates that homeschooling met a variety of needs peculiar to the rural, rural South. Chronically cash poor and isolated in farms and plantations with transportation slow and difficult, 
Families who educated their children at home avoided many of the obstacles that would hamper efforts to introduce a systemic education structure to the South throughout the antebellum period. Parents who arranged for instruction at home found themselves able to exert for full control over both their children's education and their discipline, something many parents still find attractive today. The total synchronization with family life allowed by homeschooling also proved especially important in the agricultural South and offered, offered parents a convenience impossible in formal schools. This trend continued throughout the antebellum period. But in addition to homeschooling, we also had plenty of private schools in existence in the South. There were a large number of formal schools in the Gulf South states during the antebellum period. These numbers come from the US Census for the Gulf South states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And it shows an increase in the number of private schools and academies. L primary schools were often referred to as common schools in the literature of the time period. Um, seminaries and academies was usually the term for what we would think of as secondary schools, more of a high school curriculum. But these existed throughout the Gulf South states. Some were permanent and existed for decades. Some were much more fleeting. Often a teacher would come to town and open up a school and the school would only be in existence for a few months before the teacher went to another area. Usually that seems to be financial. Um, if they felt like they weren't getting paid enough or they felt like there were other financial um, opportunities in other places, we find that these schools don't exist. Although some families took it on, you often had parents and children all teaching at the school together. And in those sorts of situations, it seems to be a more permanent structure with the community invested and the schools more long lasting. The first school established in the city of Mobile was described as, quote, a log cabin with a door at one end, a huge fireplace at the other, a window on each side closed by board shutters. The furniture consisted of benches and a shelf around the wall. This shelf served as a depository for books and dinner buckets, also for a writing desk. On a shelf just outside the door, the water bucket was placed, and on a nail beside it hung a long-handled gourd, which served as a common drinking cup. So the proverbial one-room schoolhouse. Um, this is a photograph of the Collinswood School, which is in downtown Ponchatoula, Louisiana. It still stands today, and has been turned into a museum. So some schools were very simple. Um, some schools were more elaborate. This is the Silliman Female Collegiate Institute in Clinton, Louisiana. Some schools offered boarding for their scholars. Many children were a uh, distance away from the school that coming back and forth the way we're used to today just isn't possible. And so often these schools offered boarding on the school premises, on the school grounds, which meant the teachers were supervising these children all day and night. I don't know many school teachers today who would want to have to go home with their kids in the evenings and continue to look over them. But some school teachers actually liked it. Um, Elizabeth Norton was a school teacher in 1822. She wrote to her sister, quote, it is a great change to have other children's commit, other people's children committed to our care, but I prefer boarders to day scholars because we have the entire management of them and can do much more good than for day scholars. Sometimes school teachers and administrators were very forward with parents about children placed under their care. There is a great exchange of letters between Judge William Palfrey of Bayou Tash and Sister Mary Bernard Graham, who ran a Catholic boarding school in Maryland where the judge's daughter attended. The sister wrote the judge constantly to complain about the girl's behavior and specifically the indulgences of her family members. She was often allowed to leave school to visit with family nearby. She was often sent home for extended vacations. And Sis Sister Mary Bernard did not think that was appropriate and was, in fact, a hindrance to the girl's education. She wrote to Judge Palfrey, quote, you have been too indulgent to her, and I am afraid that you will become sensible of this when it is too late. She is fully impressed with the idea that she can do just as she pleases. And it will be well for you to let her see that she cannot. If boarding was not available at the school itself, often local families in the town where there was a school would take on these young scholars and allow them to board in their homes. There are contracts between parents and the families with which they boarded. 
And from the letters and reminiscences, there's often quite an affection for these extended families. The home where they were boarded, they were often treated as children, in some cases um, too indulgent, as we had saw with Sister Mary. There's often parents who think the family they're boarding with are not enforcing strict enough discipline. There's very little evidence to the contrary, where they feel like the children are being mistreated by the family um, they were boarding with. Many families committed to this extra expense because the education of their children was important to them. Martha Batchelor wrote in 1860, quote, as for my children, if I can command the money, they shall have an education if they get nothing else. Without an education, they cannot achieve anything, but with it, they may achieve the highest position. Bachelor's letters to her children are really interesting because she's writing as the Civil War descends on the South, and she talks about what happens to the school system um, as the schools start to shut down, as the war descends upon the Southern states. While private schools and tutors served a number of the region's inhabitants, costs limited the pool of families who could afford to take advantage of these opportunities. State politicians, though, showed an early inclination to extend the benefits of learning to more constituents through government subsidies. The early antebellum period was a time of experimentation in the Lower South, when state governments took steps to encourage schools in the areas. Such action reveals an interest in education by Southern politicians and a belief that state governments bore some responsibility to help, basic help bring basic instruction to their younger constituents. Louisiana came into the Union in 1812, and while its first state constitution did not specifically mention education, the first governor, William C.C. C. Claiborne, often did, encouraging the state legislature to take action to establish and support schools in the state. Reading through the legislative records of these three Gulf South states in the antebellum period, there is a trend of governors speaking to the legislature in favor of education and urging the legislature sometimes to take very specific and concrete action to both establish and support schools. In Alabama, for instance, between 1818 and 1860, governors explicitly mentioned education in their annual messages 75% in 75 of their annual addresses. Schooled in the political theory of republicanism, most governors couch their arguments in favor of educational legislation by using that philosophy. The institution of white manhood suffrage across the South meant that white men would be voting and making political decisions regardless of their intellectual attainments. Everyone would benefit from a more educated voting populace. In the 1820s and 1830s, the three Gulf South states that I studied all offered appropriations to schools. Some schools were private schools already in existence, whereas some new schools were constructed with public funds. However, all of these schools in the 1820s and 1830s charged tuition. The acquisition of state money required schools to admit a certain number of students free of charge. However, this provision created trouble. Parents were loath to accept the label of pauper in order to have their children educated at state expense. As Louisiana Governor Andre Roman explained in 1833, quote, the radical vice of our system consists in the odious distinction which it establishes between the children of the rich and those of the poor. A great number of persons will forego for their children the advantages of privilege, which appears to induce them, if accepted, to the level of those who live on charity and alms. Another state official explained, quote, one of the principal causes of the want of success attendant on our system of primary instruction is, in my opinion, to be attributed to the great repugnance felt by many families to send their children at the public expense to school where there are other pupils whose parents pay for their education. This is a constant trend in the letters from these local school administrators that although this stipulation is included, that if state money is given, poor children must be admitted free of charge, there are very few parents who are willing to take advantage of that because of the stigma associated with it. While these early efforts fell far short of the free public schools most considered the benchmark in public education, the system did make sense at the time. Allocating money to local parishes and counties left decisions up to local officials, allowing people most familiar with the community to make decisions about how to best encourage education. Local officials could decide to support existing private schools with state funds, saving the expense of constructing new schools, and avoiding competing with similar institutions. Given the scarcity of teachers and the irregular attendance of most rural students, this process of state support made sense. However, there is terrible trouble visited upon the state education system 
after the Panic of 1837 wiped out much of the funding available to these state legislatures. By the 1840s, it was clear that an entirely new system was needed. This system would come from the urban areas of the South. New Orleans, Natchez, and Mobile all established successful public schools, with New Orleans especially emerging as a model of the successful free public school system. When most of us hear about New Orleans public schools, we don't have a favorable opinion. But in the antebellum period, New Orleans schools became a model that other states borrowed from to try and establish similar systems. In 1840, a prominent New Orleans resident by the name of Samuel J. Peters went to Boston to visit with Horace Mann. Horace Mann was kind of this paragon of education and especially that New England free public school model. So Peters went to Mann to learn about the Boston system and to try and bring those ideas to New Orleans. He and another resident requested the state legislature pass a new law authorizing free public schools in the city of New Orleans. The legislature did so. These schools would receive appropriations and they were, the city was also authorized to pass a tax to raise additional money to support the schools. At that point, the city of New Orleans was divided into three different municipalities. And so the school system would also be run by the three separate municipalities. Peters was from what was known as the American quarter of town, which was the second municipality. And it would lead the way in establishing these schools. They modeled their new schools on the successful example of New, of new England. Peters continued to correspond with Horace Mann, and Horace Mann went on to suggest his assistant to actually come to New Orleans and start the first public school there, and he did, a young man named J.A. Shaw, who would open the first free public school in the city of New Orleans and would be assisted by two female assistants, two female teacher assistants. The school opened in 1841. The first classes were held in a rented room in a house on Julia Street with only 26 students. However, the school grew rapidly. The following year, 1842, there would be two schools operating in New Orleans with a total enrollment of 950. The schools rap rapidly gained popularity and increased in attendance so that additional schools were constantly being constructed. New Orleans schools were divided into three levels, primary, intermediate, and secondary. Primary school students received instruction in spelling, grammar, composition, reading, writing, and arithmetic. The intermediate department added French and Latin, geography, and U.S. history, where secondary students were offered algebra, geometry, philosophy, literature, and advanced history classes. The New Orleans public schools operated five days a week, 10 months a year, from 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. These schools were completely free for all. Teachers were well paid, the school board bragged about how well their teachers were paid in comparison to other cities. Teachers were vigorously evaluated by the school board. According to the school board, quote, no teacher is employed in the schools, not in the primary department even, who is not thoroughly versed in spelling, reading, grammar, geography, arithmetic, and history. In order to ascertain this, every applicant for employment as teacher is required to undergo a rigid examination in all of these branches. Despite the rigid, rigid examinations, applications poured in so that the school board bragged it had, quote, an unlimited choice in who they hired. One of the trends that's obvious is what we call a feminization of the teaching prof profession in the 1830s and 1840s. Really in the 1810s and 1820s, it's almost always male teachers. In the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, that really starts to change to female teachers. Now, the female teachers are getting paid less, um, so there's certainly a reason for that. But according to the New Orleans School Board, they believe that female teachers are more gentle and more um, attentive to the morals of the students. And so they argue that they are making a valid choice here in choosing to hire female teachers instead of hiring male teachers. But really, you know, you wouldn't think that the New Orleans teachers are being paid as well as some of these other northern cities, but they were. Um, the school board in New Orleans clearly took great pride in the school. When you're reading the reports, both the legislative reports, the parish superintendents, the state superintendents, as well as the school board reports themselves, the school board was constantly at these schools, constantly checking on things. They attended examinations. They gave out awards to students. They're examining the teachers, hiring teachers, paying the teachers. And there's a clear sense of community ownership of these local schools. The community is very involved and seems to be very proud 
according to the school board, they attracted wealthy families as well, as excuse me, as well as those of modest means. According to school administrators, quote, for coming as many of the children do from opulent and influential citizens who before confided their education to the private schools, it affords the most conclusive evidence, not only that the prejudices against public schools in general have yielded and been overcome, but that these public schools in their judgment afford better opportunities for their children acquiring a good practical education than the private ones. The school system in New Orleans added a public lending library in the 1850s, a lyceum lecture series, and night classes for young people who weren't able to attend during the day because they were working. And all of this instruction remained completely free. The New Orleans cities did receive state appropriations, but it was a paltry amount. And so they raised additional revenue through city taxes. This led New Orleans schools to thrive throughout the antebellum period. According to one beaming Crescent City official, the city, quote, wields the two mighty levers that move the world, commerce and education. And by her enlightened liberality in the causes of universal education, no less than by her energy and success in commercial pursuits, she deservedly takes the first rank among all the cities of the South. Now, Mobile also built a public school system in the antebellum period. Um, they built a schoolhouse in 1836 on donated land, although it starts as a private school charging tuition. That would not change in the 1850s. In 1852, they reorganized what had been a private academy known as Barton Academy into a free public school. It reopened as a free school in 1852 with 400 students. By the following year, the enrollment had doubled to 1854 student, to 854 students. Like in New Orleans, we see leadership coming from local men who offered guidance and financial support. There were primary and intermediate departments as well as a junior and a senior high school in Barton Academy. According to one observer, quote, the schools attained so high a character, both with regard to discipline and thoroughness of instruction, that the rich soon sought them for their children in preference to sending them to the best private schools the city afforded. Like New Orleans and Mobile, Natchez would also build a school in the antebellum period known as Natchez Institute. Natchez very specifically went to New Orleans and copied their rules and regulations and brought them back to Natchez. Um, at first, that first year, they adopted the regulations, organization, and rules of the New Orleans school system entirely. In succeeding years, though, they would tweak the system so that it worked better specifically for Natchez. The school opened in 1849 with an enrollment of 555 students. School administrators were quick to compare the newly created Natchez Institute with other schools across the country, even the most uh, exemplified Boston. There's an interesting debate in Natchez and the newspapers about establishing the free public school and the additional taxes that would, be need, that would need to be levied in order to do so. Of course, people speaking in favor as well as those speaking against. But in 1856, the school board explained, quote, that which was once regarded as a hazardous tax upon the people and which cautious men feared might prove a failure is now part of the settled policy of the city, bearing equally upon all and distributing its benefits alike to all how wisely it was planned and how judiciously it has been conducted. It is easy to perceive, for it has met its largest promise, retained the confidence of its patrons, and given such an impulse to public education as to pl place us far in advance of other portions of the state. All three school systems share some characteristics. Obviously being in an urban area meant that there were more people living closer together. So that means more students that can easily attend the school as well as more teachers. Prominent citizens took responsibility for these schools, participating, guiding, often giving donations to help the schools continue. And the city governments passed taxes to supplement any state aid to help fund the schools. All three school systems would be thriving in the 1850s, leading other residents outside of urban areas to start asking for their own free school systems. So we will start to see those systems developed in the 1840s and 1850s, despite what previous literature has said on the issue. In my estimation, there are three elements which combined to help create a statewide public school system in the Gulf South states when it did. First is a steady economic recovery from the Panic of 1837. While that financial downturn did hit the school funds terribly, 
the Gulf South states will recover pretty rapidly in the 1840s, and they will start investing some of that money in the school system. There's also the example of a thriving public school system in their urban areas. Once there are schools in New Orleans and Mobile and Natchez, rural residents want their own schools. There's also the spread of Jacksonian democracy, which led middling Southerners to demand inclusion in areas of privilege not previously offered to the less wealthy, including schooling. In earlier decades, many viewed learning as something to be purchased and therefore a privilege for those who could afford it. In the 1840s, Southerners began to see access to education as a right of citizenship, and they demanded that their state governments provide it. Just as the push for white manhood suffrage sought to grant a larger segment of the population access to voting rights, Southerners agitated for greater access to schooling. In Louisiana, the statewide school system would come thanks to a new state constitution. In an 1844 popular vote, 80% of Louisiana voters favored calling a constitutional convention. The resultant 1845 state constitution democratized Louisiana's political system. It curbed the power of wealthy legislatures. It took steps to prevent common abuses of office, protected civil liberties, and granted a much larger segment of the state's population the right to vote and seek office by abrogating property qualifications. The 1845 constitution did not just require the legislature to encourage schools, as previous legislation had stated, but instead required the legislature to actually establish them. In accordance, legislation was passed in 1847 to comply and establish free public schools in the state of Louisiana. This legislation created the position of state superintendent of education to be appointed by the governor, and each parish would elect an education superintendent. Funding for the new system came from a mill and poll tax, as well as income from the 16th section lands. Each parish would receive state funding based on the number of school-aged children living there. The law specifically intended for all white inhabitants between the ages of six and 16 to attend school free of charge. Each parish was divided into school districts and schools commenced under this system. We start to see our first free public schools outside of New Orleans and Louisiana. While conditions differed from parish to parish, there's no denying that significant progress was made. According to one parish official, quote, before the parish had no more than three or four stinted schools, which could hardly stand the ground. The new school law had a great impact and produced, quote, a very satisfactory result. It must rejoice the friends of free public schools. It is a triumph for those who have faith in the doctrine of progress. It will cheer up the hearts of those who have little faith in it and are despondent. Based on the reports of parish superintendents, in 1848, there would be 78 free public schools in the state of Louisiana. The law was passed in 1847. So the next year, they had 78 schools up and running with an enrollment of more than 2,000. By 1851, that number would go up to 683 schools. I think I have some numbers here, yeah. So clearly people were taking advantage of these schools. Anyone who is well-versed in Louisiana politics know there's always an asterisk. So the 1845 constitution was a very democratic constitution um, by Southern standards. And it was only in effect for seven years. In 1852, there would be a new state constitution, which would really take a state step backwards. In 1852, the state was saddled with a much more restrictive constitution that resembled the stringent 1812 document, the original constitution, more so than the Democratic 1845 one. Alarmed by the impressive reforms realized through the 1845 document, wealthy planners sought to reassert their control through a new constitution. Allowing monopolies and granting the wealthy parishes dominance of the legislature through the apportionment of legislative seats, the new constitution reflected the prevailing mood of state officials. Thus, it's not surprising that the legislature significantly altered the school law that year in ways that did irreversible damage. They cut the salary of the state su superintendent by two thirds. They removed the requirement that the state superintendent actually visit individual schools and parishes. They abolished the office of parish superintendent altogether and replaced that school official with an unpaid board of district directors whose apathy and ineptitude would soon prove detrimental. This is indicative of the mood of the Louisiana legislature throughout the 1850s. It would take steps to act on behalf of the elite at the expense of the plain folk of our state. The 1852 Constitution based representation in both houses on total population, including slaves. In 
It stripped funding and supervision of public schools. It exempted slave property from taxation. It appropriated state funds to repay owners whose slaves were convicted of crimes. It denied protection to families whose property was seized by sheriffs. It refused to extend the time for payment for lands bought from the state. It removed restrictions on rate of interest for money lenders. And it continually privatized roads, allowing planters to control access to market. This is indicative of a larger mood in Louisiana politics to take from the poor to give to the rich. There are constant reports from local officials and the state superintendent about the damage done to public schools. In some parishes where half the school age children had been attending school prior to 1852, less than one third were attending after this legislation. In one parish in particular, there were 13 public schools prior to 1852 and three in the years following. Another constant complaint was a lack of funding. The amount of state appropriation was insufficient to run a school year round. So different parishes dealt with this differently. Sometimes they ran a school as long as the money held out, which was typically three months. Sometimes they, lose, they raised local taxes, like we see in the urban areas like New Orleans, Mobile, and Natchez. Sometimes they relied on donations, and sometimes they went back to charging tuition. One Livingston Parish official reported, quote, the funds apportioned to this parish will hardly keep a school three months, and parents think they are oppressed that they have to pay their taxes and receive no benefit of any importance from it. What their children learn in one school, they forget before there is another in operation. One thing is certain, this system apportionment has reduced the number of schools materially and retarded the progress of education. So while Louisiana took steps backwards, we do see Mississippi and Alabama making some steps towards a statewide public school system. In Mississippi in 1845, we find both the Whig Party and the Democratic Party lobbying in favor of legislation reform. Whigs were typically seen as the party of education, but in a local level, when you're looking at the Southern state governments, we see it coming from the Democrats as well. And both parties in 1845 in Mississippi were committed to supporting a statewide system of public schools. The legislature in Mississippi, though, would not pass a purely statewide system. It, it passed legislation that pertained to particular parishes. And so it was a truly local system in the state of Mississippi, as opposed to a statewide system. Nonetheless, by 1860, there would be more than 1,000 free public schools in the state of Mississippi. Alabama was a little later into the game. They do not establish a statewide system of education until the 1850s. Similar to the original Louisiana law, it started with a state superintendent of education supported by county superintendents, and the number of schools and students in Alabama would increase until the outbreak of the Civil War. One of the things that's obvious from reading the letters from state officials, as well as the newspapers from the time period, is that the demand for these public schools really seems to be coming from the population at large. This is not the benevolent action of legislatures but a demand from the people in these communities saying we need more. There have been taxes apportioned for free public schools for decades and no free public schools exist. We have to fix the system. Such agitation, along with evidence that Southern families throughout the socioeconomic ladder embraced avenues for learning when available, reveals that the previous historiographical consensus that there were few schools in the South because Southerners did not value education demands revision. Residents in the Gulf South states embraced learning and demanding that their state government step in to do more to extend access. While politicians in the, street, in the three states responded with differing levels of action, the impulse was the same among the people. Southerners embraced, valued, and demanded education. Southerners tried different strategies to make sure that their, their children had access to learning. Early citizens sought to provide the means of learning to their children, whether this meant patronizing a private school, hiring an instructor to teach their children in their own home, or appointing a family member. Aside from the obvious commitment to, of parents to educational pursuits, the state did early become involved in fostering learning. As soon as areas bordering the Gulf of Mexico came under American control, the governments there began legislating to foster education. In the 1820s and 1830s, these efforts focused on aiding private schools already in operation. State aid helped support schools so they could reduce tuition costs and offer free instruction to children from poor families. While the Panic of 1837 created a serious obstacle to educational progress, the economic recovery of the 1840s coincided with the maturation of Jacksonian democracy there. 
this political philosophy with which assaulted vestiges of privilege within the political system and demanded greater democracy led Southerners to demand access to privileges formally reserved for the elite, including schooling. Voters began to demand government-supported free schools just as prosperity returned to the region, making such ventures possible. The urban areas of the South led the way, establishing successful public schools. In New Orleans, Natchez, and Mobile, city leaders took the necessary measure to create public institution, and these schools thrived, evidence of the support that they received from the surrounding community. Residents in rural areas took notice. The successful example provided by schools in the cities, along with the financial recovery from the Panic of 1837 and the spread of Jacksonian democracy, combined to lead Southerners to insist that their state governments do more to foster opportunities for learning. The agitation by voters forced their state legislatures to act so that before 1860, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama all housed statewide public school systems. The story of educational development in the Gulf South reveals that Southerners valued education. While statewide school systems there did lag behind the accomplishments of New England states, this fact does not indicate a disregard for the intellectual well-being of young Southerners. When considering the achievements of Southern education, one must jettison the historiographical bias that measures all academic progress in relation to the establishment of public schools in Massachusetts. When one considers the South in context, including its frontier-like setting, the low population density, and the informal modes of learning available, it is obvious that education remained an ambition of Southern society throughout the antebellum period. This fact helps to shed light on the people who inhabited the region in the 19th century and demands inclusion in the larger narrative of Southern history. Thanks, y'all. All right, so that's it. That's my book in a nutshell. So if you want a copy, I'll be happy to sign it for you. And you can read all my uh, footnotes and see where all my research came from to try and prove the argument that I'm making there. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, sir. What is the reason that uh, in that first book you showed, they said there was no education system was a, you know, wh why was it? It hadn't been documented. So essentially my book didn't exist, right? No, but I mean I, I, it, nobody, nobody had documented. Nobody had taken the time to say there was schools in the South. You know, that everybody. Was written there. 2009. Okay. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So it just, I, I honestly think nobody had bothered to really research. It's not easy research to do because the sources aren't readily available. And so I think it had just been overlooked. You know, there's this great paragon in Boston of this free public school system available for all. And even though there was a school system in New Orleans, nobody had really looked very carefully at it. And so I think it had just been overlooked. And my hope is that we'll be able to take it for what it is. It's not perfect. There were a lot of flaws and failures and problems, but they were trying. And so I think that deserves to be studied and included. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, I was interested in looking at New Orleans as the vanguard of education in 1840. Um, we also know that the population is growing rapidly in New Orleans during this time period, both because of the domestic slave trade and also rising immigration. How did that square with your research? Do you see any evidence that this is about assimilation? It was definitely coming from people who identified as American as opposed to French. You know, so that that sort of public education system in New England, a lot of people involved in actually creating the system maybe had moved from New England. And so they were very familiar with that system and they were very much trying to bring Louisiana and the, specifically the Crescent City into that New England model. Yes, ma'am. French or English? Both. They had to. They had to do both. So that meant dual teachers, dual textbooks, everything. That add, of course, added a considerable expense, but it was both. Yes, ma'am. The differences in gender education. How are the differences? Once we get public schools, both men, both boys and girls. Now it's just considered primary and secondary education, but both boys and girls were free, were receiving free public education. Same, yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> so should should we talk about modern pay rates? Right? Should we talk about what what? No, go ahead. Um, what was fascinating, though, is that the disparity between the, the, the salary in New Orleans is far less, far, far less than it was in the North. And I wonder what the modern numbers look like now. You know, maybe I should pull them just for the fun of it, because it really, it, you wouldn't expect that, right? I mean, look at the difference in Boston um, between a male and a female principal teacher. And then look at the difference between a male principal teacher in New Orleans with a female 
$320. Not astounding. And even, and even there's only a $200 difference between the male assistant, whereas there's an $800, $750 difference between the male and the female in Boston. And the New Orleans School Board was very proud of this. What led me to these numbers was the New Orleans School Board bragging about it. You know, that's where I, why I found the numbers. So you keep on, you, you kept on talking about the Jacksonian democracy uh, influence. And obviously Jackson was, was a huge hero in New Orleans. And Jackson's arch enemy was John Quincy Adams. Sure. In, in, in Boston, but I find it fascinating that, yeah, they went up to Boston to, to, to look at it. But obviously in New Orleans, it, it's, it's easier to assimilate it. Well, and, you know, certainly the French section was less um, quick to embrace. You know, there was a lot of opposition from Catholic educators in the right. city who didn't want the state impugning on what they saw as their territory. And there were parents who were concerned about the moral instruction and what that potentially means. But it looks like they were able to overcome it based on the numbers of enrollment and the way the city, you know, ramped up the funding for it and really seemed to support the schools. One, 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 two, two follow-up questions. You, you told me after the, the, you noted that after the uh, Constitutional Convention in 1852, that they abolished, they abolished the state Fair superintendent. The, the state superintendent. They didn't abolish that office. They just drastically right. reduced his salary and his requirements, right, and his responsibilities. Right, but they also abolished the powers of Parish. the division. And then they brought up these. District local, directors, directors, unpaid. Did, was that the genesis of local school boards? No, I think it, I honestly think it was before that because like each parish was given responsibility for establishing school districts and starting schools. And so it, it starts very local from the beginning, but the parish superintendents were being paid to be parish superintendents. So you would expect that they attended to their job a little more reasonably. The unpaid boards of directors, I mean, if you read the reports coming into the state superintendent, it is just constant complaints that these guys weren't doing anything because they weren't getting paid to do anything probably, right? So they were not offering any sort of supervision. And if you look at the city school systems, you know, if you look at New Orleans, Natchez, and Mobile, local administration is what made sure everybody was doing what they were supposed to and that the schools were thriving. And so when you take away those parish superintendents, there are certain parishes where you had devoted people and the schools continued to function, but the majority, you know, if I had to quantify it, the majority really struggled in the aftermath of that decision. And my final follow did, did your research um, look at, 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 at this area at any, I'm the, specifically Grand Coteau and, and, and the Jesuits and the, and the nuns, because that was a boarding school, you know, that, that, that's been here. Historically I did not. I really tried to stay away from parochial schools. Right. You know, in Louisiana, there's so many. Right. <laughs> I was trying to focus on the state system. Right. And to be fair, there is some there's some secondary research out there already on the parochial school systems. And I was trying to do something different. Okay. Nice research. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, New Orleans had a large population of free people as well. Were they allowed to send their children to the public schools? They were not. And Neither Natchez nor Mobile. And interestingly, in Natchez, when there's that debate, they have a really great a series of articles in the Natchez newspapers in 1844 and 1845 when they're talking about establishing the school system and the taxes that would be necessary. And a woman writes in and says, look, I'm all for establishing free public schools, but I'm worried about the taxes and specifically that it, the burden is going to fall unfairly on two groups of people. One is bachelors, and she says, and I feel no remorse for them because they're bachelors by their own choice. But the other is free people of color who are going to be taxed but not allowed to go to the schools. But, you know, the bulk of the southern population wasn't concerned about that, were they? Yes, sir. Is there a certain bias to an area that needs a higher education or more education? The rural south not needing to be more educated because of the economy. Is there any study that establishes why maybe in the north the salaries are higher? They were more emphasis. Well, I think it really has to do with the rural nature of the society, right? In the north, there are more cities and more towns, and it's easier to situate a school where more children can attend. You know, the, just the demography of people being so far spread out in the south really hurts the ability to establish schools. I mean, you know, today, if you're choosing a school for your kid, you look at location and proximity to your home. And so they did the same thing. It was just it was just more difficult then. But I do find from, you know, anecdotally, from the letters and the diaries, parents really wanted their kids to have 
access to schooling and often went to great lengths and great expense and sent them far from home and had them bored with strangers to be able to get to a school to learn something. And so I do feel like there is the desire from average Southerners for this education, although that's another thing that the historiography of the South you know, likes, again, to kind of case cast us from this New England example is that we were all bumpkins who didn't care to learn. And I just don't think that's true. It's hard for me to quantify that, though, because it's like anecdotal evidence. But I really, my hunch is that that's not just, that they wanted the education and took advantage of it when they could. Yes, ma'am. Is all that information presented today in the book? Yes, ma'am. Completely. Book available to you? It is. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's so many things that went through my mind as you were making your presentation. Thank you, you know, for for um, um, presenting this material to us. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking is a lot of the, in terms of the desire to educate their children. It seemed as if you you're talking about the people. There was no middle class, right? There are these extremely wealthy planners who got their great wealth from the free labor they got from the enslaved Africans. And then there were very poor people, few merchants in between, you know, few pro white professionals. But it seems as if it's more, the people who gave their blessing to the, the creation of the public schools were the people who already had that, that those values because of their, their, um, their lifestyles, their wealth that allowed them to form those values. Um, the people who were out there working, and I'm not just talking about the enslaved or the free people of color who might have been very poor. Of course, there were some very wealthy free people of color. Yes. But they were trying to live. Yes. You know, they had all these children. A lot of them just had a lot of, lot of children because they couldn't, they, they couldn't afford to purchase enslaved Africans. And they couldn't afford to pay people wages. So they had a lot of kids. They needed those kids to keep the home, you know, going. Well, and that's when it's the economy. And a lot of those people weren't educated themselves. That's so true. They weren't going to have the same value system I, as the planner family. I do believe that there's a larger middle class in the mm -hmm. South than some historians have acknowledged. And again, anecdotally, I can tell you that there's plenty of examples of these people sending their kids to schools. And one of the complaints that we do get is them pulling the kids out when they need them to help on the farm. Like you get that complaint from school administrators and teachers saying parents are keeping their kids at home to do field work and we need them in school. And so the kids were attending at some point, right? And then they were going home and maybe not coming back the next day. So they were definitely in school, although it may have been more fleeting than what we would have liked, right? So I do think, I do think there is a middle class in the South, and I do think they were attending these schools when they could. That's part of the argument that I make. I would love to see that school of research go further, and the, this is fascinating, because um, uh, I'd love to see what the middle class looked like, say, in, in, in these smaller IU parishes, and how it impacted the population of, of school children. Absolutely. In terms of their attendance. Uh, I know your your research did not cover that period going into slavery, and certainly not Reconstruction right. and Crow period, because that's when things really changed. Right, and so and eighteen sixty eight and fascinating changes. Was, there's a there's a lot more to be said about this time period, but yet yeah, I stop in eighteen sixty. Yeah. But there's so much more. There's so much more. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. I was curious um, with the school system developed around the state, school boards and stuff like that, certain parishes were formed, let's say after the Civil War. Right. Would the size, how they were adjusting the size of different parishes have an effect on the fact that a lot of the parishes were having to pay their own schooling systems and all? And sure. Tax, and so they were really not... Well, the state appropriations was based on the number of school age children in, residing in each individual parish. And obviously, after during Reconstruction, we start carving up some new pay, parishes. There are some really interesting examples. Again, my research did not go into Reconstruction at all. But, you know, there's a Tangipahoe Parish superintendent appointed from Connecticut who comes down during Reconstruction, empties the parish uh, endowment, and goes back to Connecticut. He's reappointed the next year 
and comes back down and does the same thing. I mean, he just absconds with the entire allotment for Tangiboho Parish. And so there's so much more to be done, you know, if I were to continue chronologically, but that is outside the scope of this research presented here. Well, y'all, thanks so much for coming out. I appreciate you being here on a Saturday morning.